by 93, mm -hmm. Cypress Hill, House of Pain, all these things are mammoth. What, um, mm -hmm. what was it like? Uh, Muggs is going to produce some of which do be UB. You're going to produce some of which do be UB. Like, how did you guys decide uh, using mugs, not overusing mugs, not using too little mugs? How did that all end up working out for your participation on the production side of which do be UB? Well, with DJ Muggs, man, you know, salute to DJ Muggs. You know, I got a lot of love for him as well. Um, he always wanted me to have my own thing. You know, from the time that House of Pain was recorded, when I got in the studio to record those records with House of Pain, I think those were days that he couldn't make the studio. And he was like, yo, let Ralph go in and do something, you know, and let, let fuck with Ralph. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead, go do that song. So in the beginning, like we were, we were basically, that's how tight we were. We would, we would connect every day. You know, we would listen to beats, you know, we play each other beats on the phone and constantly conferring. Um, with that blessing, with the House of Pain, of course, I was there for the first demos. I'll never forget when Everlast would come over. When, we, when, when he told me, he was like, yo, I mean, technically, I'm the, I'm the first soul assassin in the production squad. Um, when he set out to do, when, once he finished Cypress Hill album, he was like, okay, I'm starting this production crew, Soul Assassins. I had just departed from Kid Frost and, and you know, a mutual thing, nothing bad. It was just a thing that I knew that I had to grow into these other things that I first started with, because that was more of a DJ um, situation for me. Although I did be, I, do, I did get on those records, you know, with Kid Frost's second album, of course, with the, uh, what's that one song called? The, uh, another firme, another firme rola, which was, I'm cutting up the bat cause I'm brown, bat, bat, bat cause I'm brown. And then I'll never forget those records, of course, and made on SB1200, et cetera. Virgin Records, you know, big shit. You know, I traveled, I did a thousand shows with Kid Frost. You know what I mean? Like, just literally traveled the world with that guy. He was the first guy that really took me there. Not to stray away from the question, but my point with that is, too, also, is with Muggs, is that when he, when we decided that Funk Dubious, which was a song that Be Real wrote, when we decided, oh, you know, I told him, I said, yo, Funk Dubious is us. That's Sun Doobie. That's T-Funk. That's myself. That song is too dope to just be a song. We have to take that name. And so that's where Funk Dubious was born. And so, um, he, you know, he, 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 was, he wanted that. And, you know, and, and he oversaw the project. He, he didn't produce anything on the record other than mix, which is production too. I'll give him that. You know, mixing, engineering is part of production. But he didn't make one, not one beat on that record other than mixing, overseeing, and, and helping with, with, with the mix, you know, the arrangement. And yeah, he helped us. He, he, so in that sense, he was the overlord but he didn't touch not one drum machine for that for that album. It was T. Ray, Lethal, and Ralph M. on that record. And we and then I had the most songs on that album because, you know, that was the group that Ralph M. was was going to create to, you know, introduce to the world. And he wanted that for me. You know, he was the one that was like, "Yo, I want I want you to have your thing." You know, it's important that you have your thing and that you know. You could produce for a lot of different people, but it's important that you produce for one group first, you know? And so he taught me those things. It was like, look at Marley Mall, you know, he's got Jewish crew. He's got his own crew. He's got, look at Hank Shockley, look at those guys. They produce for their, they do things with their, for themselves and their groups first. They produce a group first and then they go in and do other things. So with Muggs, um, you know, he, he helped me, he helped me a lot. He helped me a lot as far as development, and vice versa, because I was always very critical and I was very honest with him. I would never be a yes man when it came to, to him producing records or what I thought. And I heard something, I'd be like, what is that? Okay, well, so, so what the fuck is up with that beat? You know, or whatever. I would always be critically honest with him and vice versa. And that's how I think that he, we developed a strong friendship based on those things. You know what I'm saying? And to this day, I'm still that same dude. What's up? What, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Why are you doing? 
that doesn't that that emotion doesn't feel like what he's talking about. You got something better? You got some other shit? You know what I mean? Like that's that was me, and we were honest with each other. Got it. So moving from which Doobie Ubi to Brothers U Doobie, yes. What uh, it seemed like sonically, but also mm -hmm. thematically, that the mm -hmm. album took a very different direction where the first one seemed lighter, more funny, mm -hmm. not as many stories, whereas K Sera Sera, for instance, mm. and a lot of the beats were, mm -hmm. it just wasn't as hap happy or festive, I guess, mm. um, sonically. Mm. So what, what happened, Cypress Hill had a similar thing, but they were already dark, but they went darker for Black Sunday, Temples of Boom, they were already super dark and they just went darker. But you guys, I would say, were more festive, more uh, bright sonically. Mm -hmm. But then with Brothers Doobie, it kind of went darker. So what happened with you, with Sun Doobie, with uh, T-Funk? Like what was going on to make that change? Well, for Brothers Doobie, the second album, we knew that we had to switch it up. And we knew that Sun Doobie had knowledge. He had the knowledge because prior to that, he was he was a Muslim. He was he was you know he was a guy that was a Nation of Islam Muslim in Los Angeles, you know, um, studying the lessons, five percent, uh, you know, slanging bean pies on Crenshaw Boulevard, you know, with with, with real OGs like with Cam with Cam's brother, with Mustafa, um, you know, he was down with that clique. And so and that was still like late 80s. We knew that Sunduvi had that, that he knew that, we knew that he could deliver a song like Rock On with like Dedicated, Que Sera Sera. And then even on the other note, we still had fun where we still had songs like Super Hoes with made, made the Friday soundtrack. You know what I'm saying? Like, we still knew that we could go, we could, we could do that 360, you know what I'm saying? Like completely. And so we were like, yo, he's got it. Let's use it. Let's make sure that people know that Funk Dubious is not only one-sided, but they're, they're a full-fledged group. And then I, I'll never forget with that Brothers Doobie album, that was strictly DJ Muggs and myself. I think Lethal did one song on that album. Yeah, he did, um, he did one song. Um, but that was strictly Muggs and myself all the way through from the, the intro to the end. You know what I'm saying? We just were going back and that was us. And, you know, I think that we, we uh, at that point in the career, we had to shed that light to show the difference. Things had changed. You know, um, rap wasn't as, you know, it was, in a, it was going into a certain, like you had to bring it and we brung that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, to this day, I'm so proud of that album. I mean, somebody just re somebody just bootlegged that record for the 25th uh, reissue anniversary. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like somebody re bootlegged that shit. Yeah, man, they they put that out there in Europe, and it's the blue record. So if you see that blue record, just know that somebody bootlegged that. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, man. And with Superhose in particular, mm -hmm. and Triple X mm -hmm. Funk, and all these things. Yes. How, um, because porn is still like this other thing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. for you guys, when you guys were doing it, it was still like taboo. Like people were like, whoa, what is porn? Da, da, da. So what made, you guys, <laughs> what made you guys comfortable to promote that you guys were so into it or especially some doobie? Well, I'll say like this and, that, and that's just, it was, I think it started off as a joke it was just to describe the raw, unadulterated funk sound that we were bringing. That was it. But, you know, even on the first album, of course, you know, we joke with the Porno King and shit like that. That was, we joke. That was a lighthearted joke. It was not to be taken so extreme. You know what I mean? It was just a joke. And so uh, I think even to this day, it's still a joke. I just think the label went too far. Uh, they took it too far. They, everybody took it too far, where it was like, oh, yeah. And then, he, I mean, I think even Sun Doobie took it too far. You know, and then it got to the point where it was like, yo, dude, like, 
what are you doing? You know, and, I, and, and you know, I never wanted to go in that direction. It was more of, it was the funk dubious is the triple X sound that we bring is the raw, unadulterated funk. That's it. And it's that, and it's that, and it's a metaphor to be used as, as that, and that's it. And then I think I just think that the label brought out uh, uh, different uh, things that made it more negative in the eyes of others. You know what I'm saying? Because that's not what we're about. It was uh, we were having fun. Yeah, we of course. Come on now, uh, you know we love, you know the women. We love. I mean, come on. We've made love to some of the most beautiful women in the world. You know. We don't want, I, for me personally, it was something that was like, okay, don't go so far with it. You know what I'm saying? Have fun with this. It's a, you know, it's lighthearted fun, funk dubious, but um, that's, you know, that was something that, that uh, I, for me, I struggled with because um, here you are, you got people throwing all this mud on you and you're like, yo, but hold on. Like, that's, that's not what, you know, and you don't have to, for me, I don't have to. It was tough because, yo, I got to explain this to everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, as a young kid, you know, I'm 20, I'm in my 20s now, you know? And then, so I'm like, whoa, what the, what the fuck is going on with all this shit? If that's what, no, that's not what we're, everybody just took that and ran with it. Even though it was something different, just like Cypress Hill, you know, they, the people were talking about smoking weed and shit like that. Nobody was talking about that. People were scared. As a child growing up, smoking weed and getting tattoos, you had to be a crazy motherfucker. You had to be crazy to do those things. And that's the things that I was brought up in, in that environment. Where I was like, what? Oh, he smoked. Oh, he has a tattoo. He's, he's, whew, he's wild, boy. That's wild shit. And look at the 90s. Look at the 90s going into the 2000s. You know what I mean? So. I was never a guy that really wanted to go full fledged on that, on those topics like that. I would say we have fun with it and hey, yo, what's up? You know what I mean? Like, you know, if you're a woman and you're into that, cool. You know what I'm saying? I'm cool with that too, whatever. But, or should I say, and, uh, you know, that was just something I think that, that, you know, went too far. You know what I'm saying? But we had fun, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, but, but one thing I learned as an artist, as a reality, sometimes the things that you joke about can and will become a reality in terms of like going into like, I'll never forget going to Brothers Dooley going and doing uh, record retail runs and people telling us stuff like, yo, what's up with that record, man? So, you know, the super da 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 and you doing that and what is that? Who is that? And why are you doing those things? And why are you talking? Like literally like people telling us those things. Like attacking us about the records and the explicit content that were on those records which i didn't have a problem with it was just a matter of um you know like you know you want to put good things out there in the world and stuff like that also so i never let children listen to those records like i wouldn't play those records for you know my, my nieces and nephews you know what I mean? unless they were of age because that's not what i'm about you know what i'm saying but but um i think that um we still needed to do those records and, and we did, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it is what it is. We had to follow up and uh, those records were great. Super Hose is a very creative record. I created that track, the bass line, the drums, and then me and then Muggs and myself finished the product. You know, we were working at the best studios in the world, man. Harry, uh, Harry Moslin, he had image recording records. That's the guy who recorded David Bowie, um, you know, the, the, the song Fame. Harry Moslin. I mean, he was doing all the bubblegum 80s rock records. He had, I'll never forget seeing David Hasselhoff and, and Tina Turner at those studios. You know, like literally in our sessions, like I'd come out, I'd look, I'd be like, oh shit, that's Tina Turner. Going into Harry's little little corner back there where he's doing shit. He had a little corner where he would just be engineering and building things, you know, and I'd be like, I never went back there. You know what I'm saying? Like, but it was, it was a cool time for us to, because we took the SV-1200 and we put it and brought it to the best studios. And we made sure that that sound was correct on the Trident boards 
and all on the SSL boards as well. And that those were that's why they have such a special sound. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.